Um, hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and uh, addressing this audience and uh, talking about uh, some of the work that we do. Um, we work on uh, smart mobility, uh, especially in cities. And uh, as all of us city dwellers know, uh, getting around the city is typically one of the main sources of frustrations and one of the reasons why people may want to get away. Um, so I, you know, a few years ago, I uh, started a company called Newtonomy, and you know, we've been working on developing uh, self-driving cars uh, really as a platform to enable uh, a different concept of mobi mobility for people. Why am I doing that? I had a perfectly cozy job as a professor at MIT and you know, was living a very you know, reasonable uh, yet busy life. Uh, why do, did I start doing this work? Um, well, of course, as a roboticist, you know, for me, it was just cool to do it. You know, just the car drives by itself, you know, no hands. But then you start asking yourself the question, so why are we doing this? The first reason that usually people talk about is safety. We know that most automotive accidents are due to human errors. You remove the humans, you remove the accidents. Okay? Second reason is convenience. Uh, if you don't have to drive and the car is driving itself, you can you know, sleep, watch a movie, text legally, uh, check your email, uh, so on and so forth. Another reason is providing better access to mobility to people who are maybe disabled, or maybe uh, you know, too old, too young, or maybe too intoxicated to drive. Um, another reason is to increase um, you know, throughput uh, in a city, right? the efficiency of the traffic network. Nowadays, we coordinate with other vehicles around us just by eyeballing one another. Now, if you have uh, cars that are actually connected over a wireless network, you know, the whole uh, traffic system can be optimized. Um, another point is reduction in emission and pollution and, you know, things like that. Now, these are all great reasons. These are all great benefits. However, if you think of this, these are about taking the status quo, what you have today, and making it better, which is great, right? But is that all we can do? No, I think that we can do more. And really what I'm interested in is really looking at what kind of fundamental changes this technology can induce in the way that we think of mobility. Now, how do we compare things? Uh, this is actually a very cynical approach, okay? So what I will do uh, to compare all these benefits um, is just by converting everything to money, to dollars, okay? To US dollars, okay? So the numbers refer to the US market. So, what is the value of safety? What is the value of your life? Well, to yourself, to your loved ones, to your friends, that's probably you know, priceless, right? Uh, however, to the government in the US is about $9 million, okay? So this is what is called the cost of a statistical life, and this is what is used to uh, calculate you know, uh, projects and that you know, is it is worth doing, doing something that will save lives or will cost money. Uh, anyway, there was a report released by NHTSA in 2014 that shows that the economic cost of road accidents is about $300 billion a year. The societal cost, that is pain and suffering and so on and so forth, is another $600 billion a year. So total is $900 billion a year. It's a big number, okay? But let's look at what else is there. Uh, what is the cost of congestion? It's been estimated to about $100 billion a year. What is the cost of uh, pollution? It's about $50 billion a year. What comes next? So this is actually the value of the time that every single one of us will get back from not having to drive every day. Okay? And this is a very simple calculation. You know, shows that essentially multiplying one half of the median wages in the United States times the number of hours that Americans speed, spend behind the wheel what you get is $1.2 trillion a year, okay? This is already more than everything else that you see in this, in this pie chart. But what is the next piece? As you see, the lion's share in this pie chart diagram is taken by the value of sharing. Once you have a car that is able to drive itself, there is no point in keeping it in your driveway or parked somewhere if it can be used to drive other people. Now, car sharing, vehicle sharing, bicycle sharing, these are all popular systems, okay? But everybody loves the idea, 
but not as many people who are interested in it end up actually using it. Why is that? Because usually there are two problems. One is the availability of a car or a vehicle when you need it and where you need it. And two is the availability of a parking spot when you don't need the vehicle anymore. Now, imagine that you have a car that is actually able to drive itself to keep you, pick you up wherever you are within three minutes. And then when you arrive to your destination, you just step off the vehicle and the car goes and parks itself or maybe it gets refueled or recharged or just picks up the next customer, right? So all the problems, all the pain points, all the friction for you to use vehicle sharing systems are gone, right? And now what we estimate, assuming a sharing factor of four, we estimate that this will be uh, a total of, will provide a total of $1.8 trillion a year to individuals in the United States alone. Okay, so really this is why I got into this and I'm really excited about uh, this kind of work. Uh, now, this is actually a simulation that we did. Uh, we do a lot of work in Singapore for a number of reasons. Uh, what you're seeing in this video is, uh, uh, is our simulation uh, of um, you know, how a fleet of autonomous shared cars will provide mobility to the entire population of Singapore. Okay? What you see top left is the time of day. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, with the geography of Singapore, but uh, what you will notice is that the bottom part is actually where the central business district is. Okay? Uh, whenever you see a red dot, that's an empty car that is either just traveling to pick up a customer or is just waiting at some parking lot. Whenever you see blue, it's a passenger that is either traveling on a, uh, on a vehicle or waiting in queue uh, you know, to get one vehicle. Okay? So anyway, so as, as I don't know if you noticed, we can replay the video. Um, okay, so it's middle of the night, nothing happening really. Uh, but what you will see around 5.36 in the morning, there will be the morning rush, right? And you will see a flow of vehicle going from the residential areas, essentially south, uh, where the, all the most of the businesses are. You see all these people waiting, you know, summoning a vehicle at their location. These are the bubbles, uh, and eventually going. Um, during the rest of the day, uh, anytime you need a vehicle, you will get it within three minutes, no queuing at all. Uh, there is some action at, in, at lunchtime. Singaporeans like to, they're very choosy about their lunch, okay, apparently. Um, and now you see the, the evening rush, okay. Again, there is some queuing in the business district, and then you see all these red streams of vehicles that are going there to pick up customers and bring them to their home, okay. So. This is a like, nice video, okay? or at least it's nice to me. But um, what do we learn out of this video? What we learn is that a fleet of 300,000 cars can actually provide mobility to everybody in Singapore with the same quality of service that they enjoy today with public transportation of their private own, you know, privately owned vehicle. But the key point is that 300,000 is much less than 800,000, which was the total number of vehicles in Singapore at the time of the study. So what this means is that of, out, of, out of the 800,000 cars in Singapore, you can take about half a million and sell them to somebody else, you know, ship them out of the country, and free up half a million uh, spots, you know, parking spots, for example. And actually, it's usually more than that, because cities usually account for three, four times the total number of cars in terms of parking um, you know, availability. And so you, get, you give that space back to people. Okay? So uh, I grew up in Rome. Um, you know, it's a great city. Um, but unfortunately, most of it, you have cars that are double, triple parked. Now imagine that all of those disappear. Okay? And now you get people get their city back for themselves. Okay? Um, what is the key point here is that if the cars are able to drive themselves, uh, they can uh, go back and pick up uh, customers, right? Of course, you can say, well, taxi drivers can do that. Yeah, but taxi drivers are actually typically operated in a way that is decentralized, and you know, each individual taxi driver tries to decide what is best to do for himself or herself. In the case in which you have a fleet of automated vehicles, you can actually coordinate the whole um, uh, the whole fleet in, in such a way that you can optimize the quality of service that you deliver to your customer. Now, in this simulation, what we are doing is we are landing on the left a normal taxi fleet, 
On the right, what you will see a fleet of autonomous vehicles with the same number of vehicles, but these are actually operated in a way that tries to maximize the quality of service delivered to the customers. And what you will see, and sorry, this, this thing uh, kind of disappears, um, but what you will see is that we are able to serve 30% more customers, and we are able to cut the waiting time for each customer by about one half. Okay? And again, this is showing that, you know, assuming the same fleet size, we can offer much better service uh, to the customers. Um, there are a number of um, economies uh, you know, between scale and technology, but um, uh, essentially the point is that this service not only will be better, but it will also be cheaper. Okay? Um, the technology will be a little bit more expensive, right? but clearly the human cost, you know, the cost of manpower will be reduced. Now, whenever I say that, uh, a lot of people are concerned about, yeah, but what will happen to all the taxi drivers, you know, to all the people who make a living out of driving vehicles? The reality of it is, is the following, that I don't know how many people realize this, but mobility systems worldwide are actually manpower limited. The reality is that there are not enough people in the world who are actually willing to drive other people around for the price that other people are willing to pay. In fact, if you buy into the idea that this mobility on demand, you know, shared vehicles is a good idea, then what it has to happen is that one person out of seven must be a taxi driver or m must drive for Uber or Lyft or any other of those companies. Do you see that happening? No way, right? People, you know, the world will still need teachers and doctors and firemen and, you know, <laughs> um, uh, people need some people to be children, right? So, from my point of view, the impact would be mainly on the side of increased supply for mobility rather than job loss, okay? There will be some impact on wages, clearly, but that can be balanced by added value and service if you have a human driver. Okay. Um, oh, and you know what, what happens today? What happens today is that most of us are using about one seventh of our productive day driving ourselves. Okay. And again, if we are freed from that, we can use that time to do something that is more valuable to us rather than commuting to work. Okay. The question that I'm often asked is, when will this uh, happen? Um, I think that there are two parts, okay? So when, if you're asking me, when will you be able to buy your own autonomous vehicle, that is not happening for another 10, 15 years. Sorry to disappoint you. On the other hand, if you ask me, when will I be able to use, to take a ride on one of these vehicles at certain locations in the world, I will tell you next year, okay? As you see in this, in this graph, I make a difference between autonomous vehicles as vehicles in a shared fleet that people can use as a service versus vehicles that are actually owned by individuals. Um, and as you can see today, there are a number of pilots that are done in many parts in the world by ourselves and some of the other companies operating in this space. We are hoping to launch a commercial service by next year in Singapore and then grow to other cities, other locations as well, uh, hopefully uh, quickly. Um, just to give you an idea, um, this is a video that shows uh, one, of our car, uh, one of our cars driving in Singapore. Actually, this was taken, it's a video that we shot about three, four months ago, okay? Um, it's sped up four times, so we don't drive like that, okay? <laughs> um, so it's sped up four times, just, you know, otherwise the, the video will be a little bit too boring, it's too, it's too long. But as you can see, uh, today we are able to drive in traffic in a place like Singapore and, you know, handle things like, you know, red light, oh, this is an interesting one. So this actually is a very busy intersection, and here we are making a right-hand turn. In Singapore, they drive on the left, right? So when you're making a, a right-hand turn, as you will see, you're actually merging into traffic. So that's the difficult part. And now look at this uh, intersection, right? So here we have buses, trucks coming. So before you make a decision to go, you have to make sure that there's nobody that is hiding behind the bus or something like that, right? Construction zones, um, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, stop signs. Uh, 
Um, and you know, as, as you can see, um, you know, there is a, a lot of action uh, in these places. And as I said before, we are really looking for a, um, a commercial launch next year. Uh, let me conclude. Uh, so this is our mission. Really what we want to do is improve the safety, efficiency, and the accessibility of transportation in cities worldwide. And you know, this is what we are you know, aiming to do. And real, for this, we are starting with personal mobility, but nothing prevents us to do that at the level of uh, public transport, you know, shuttles, buses, and also do it for freight and logistics. OK, I will end here uh, in the interest of time. Uh, something I would like to tell you is, um, you know, as much as I would have liked to stay for the Q&A session, unfortunately, due to the strikes in Paris, uh, I understand that you know, my flight has been rebooked to an earlier flight, so I will have to run uh, away. But uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have by email or any other ways. Uh, just Google my name. I'm easy to find. Thank you very much.